So we will just wait a bit while the room fills up. And um, can you see the room? I can't no. see the room. Can you see? Mm -mm. But I know because, yeah. So good evening, everyone. I'm Barbara Corcoran, Vice President of Education at the New York Botanical Garden. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the closing lecture in this year's portfolio series, Landscapes on the Edge, and to welcome our very special guest, Walter Hood. My sincere gratitude goes to the Heingold Foundation for its generous support of the series again this year, and a special thank you to Susan Cohen. I know she's in the audience. Thank you, Susan. She is our landscape design program coordinator and has guided and shaped this beloved series since its inception 22 years ago. Before I introduce our speaker, a few quick notes, housekeeping to enable live captions in English, click the closed captions CC button, then click show subtitles. Also, if you think of a question at any time, don't wait until the end. Please start sending your questions in whenever you think of them. Click the Q&A button at the bottom of your window and type it in. We will raise these for Walter to answer at the end. So tonight, we are so very proud to have Walter Hood with us. Walter Hood is the creative director and founder of Hood Design Studio in Oakland, California. He is also chair and professor of landscape architecture and environmental planning at UC Berkeley. In 2019, he was awarded both the MacArthur Fellowship and the Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize. As an artist and a landscape architect, Walter creates urban spaces that enrich the lives of current residents while also honoring communal histories. Over his career, he has transformed traffic islands, vacant lots, and freeway underpasses into ecologically sustainable public places that challenge the legacy of urban neglect and empower marginalized communities. Recently, Walter has undertaken ambitious commemorative landscapes that reflect his interests in the role of sculpture in public place. For Charleston's International African American Museum, on the site where nearly 40% of enslaved Africans arrived in this country, he has designed a memorial garden filled with native grasses, featuring a tidal pool where water recedes at regular intervals to reveal an engraved pattern of life-sized figures aligned as though confined in the fold of a slave ship. You'll hear more about that project in just a few moments. So I was reading a recent interview with Walter. He's always so thoughtful and thought provoking and was struck in particular by something he said about the way he weaves history and design into narratives that resonate. So in his words, each project is fraught with chance. I am not trying to solve a problem per se. I'm trying to put something out in the world that has been covered up, erased, which might allow people to see the world and themselves in a different way. I think we are all in for a truly enlightening evening and NYBG is indeed privileged to have Walter Hood as our guest. I will be back at the end to take audience questions. And now please take it away, Walter. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure um, to be in New York tonight. Um, I'm also Susan, you finally got me to do this. And so I'm really happy to have to join you tonight. Uh, as Barbara was saying, I'm going to speak tonight about a single project uh, that I've been spent the last uh, few years um, working on, and it's the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. I'd like to share with you tonight this idea of a memorial to my African ancestors. And as you can kind of see, this is four years ago, we started this process of thinking about how is the best way to begin to tell a story. Um, and I was taken by Toni Morrison's quote, and also her work in trying to create places in which 
I can go and actually think about my ancestors. And she writes, there's no place you or I can go to think about or not think about, to summon the presence of or recollect the absence of slaves. There's no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. And she said this, you know, close to 20 some odd years ago. And I had a chance to visit one of her benches at Sullivan's Island and it had a huge impact on me. And I'll talk about that a little later. But six years ago, I mean, four years ago, we were asked um, to develop, put together a committee of people and consultants who could develop this um, landscape on hollowed ground in Charleston on Gadsden's Wharf. And we put together from our architectural team, but we also wanted to bring people from the city, city of Charleston, community resource people, community advisors, and we had a board. And on the board, we had Mayor Joe Riley, who has been the mayor of Charleston for I think close to 30 plus years. We also, Jonathan Green, who is a wonderful painter in the Low Country, uh, and others, Dr. Bernie Powers, Wilbur Johnson, and others who have spent probably more than the last decade trying to create what we hope will be this wonderful new institution. But just some thoughts on the history of the site, but also some thoughts on Charleston. So over two days in January, on a cold, couple of cold days, I assembled a committee and I wanted them to really get a sense of the low country and the different experiences of that landscape and then come back together and begin to charrette and think about different ideas to create this landscape at Gaston's Wharf. So our first trip, we went out to Fort Moultrie at Sullivan's Island. And it's a wonderful landscape because it's right at the mouth of the harbor, looking back out towards the Atlantic. But at Fort Moultrie, there's history there, and most of that history is of the Civil War. And very little of that history is about those slaves who came across in the Atlantic crossing, were actually put in pest houses here, incubated, and then those that survived were then taken on a slow boat to Gaston's Wharf and then sold. I was taken by this meager um, exhibition that was in the back of Fort Moultrie, um, the museum there. It was in a small room, I guess about maybe 20 by 40. But it had these exhibitions in the vitrine, and I was taken by a few of them. One was this notion of the rice field Negro, uh, that there was a particular label for that type of slave that could stand in water up to their knees and waist without developing malaria. There was also shackles and chains. There were badges that I didn't really know about, but slaves had to wear badges if they were out on the streets of Charleston, and those badges were numbered, and they actually said, what your occupation was, so if you were a potter or cook. But most fraught to me was this map here at the top, which I, at first when I saw it, it looks like textiles, but then I noticed that it was the Brooks map. And it wasn't the original lithograph, but it was actually a copy that had been copied over and over. And that stayed in my mind. And then Michael Allen, who works for the Park Service, who's pictured here on the right, he had spent 20 years um, getting this one sign on the island that says, this is Sullivan's Island, that describes the entire plight of the slaves here. And the only thing, again, that spoke to the ancestors was Tony Morrison's bench, which is here in the right-hand corner. You can barely see it, but there's a plaque on the ground. And I was overcome um, with emotion when I saw our 20-minute, 20 20-member 20 committee at Fort Moultrie in this powerful landscape that the only thing we could photograph was the plaque for Tony Morrison. And then from that, we were able then to take a ferry and then get a sense of what that ride and that feeling was like to go from the edge back to Gaston's Wharf. And then once on our site, through a sandborn map, we were able to understand the breadth and the scale of Gaston's Wharf and to locate that wharf line. 
and then on the wharf line working with archaeologists, we were able to mark that line in real space. And actually, archaeology was performed, and they actually found Gaston's Wharf located seven and a half feet down below. They exhumed some of the archaeology, but they also covered it back up because this is tidal. And then one of the most powerful places um, was Middleton Place, which is Middleton Plantation. And arriving here, I remembered from landscape architectural history that this was first presented to me 30 some odd years ago as one of the first colonial gardens in this country that was inspired by the monarchy in France, the butterfly uh, gardens that looked out towards the Ashley but there was just no mention of my ancestors in the history books. I even went back and read Michael Laurie, one of my mentors, to see if there was any mention of the laborers who built this magnificent garden. And as we toured around, the guide, you can imagine with all of us scholars, I, I, I wish I couldn't put myself in the shoes of the guide because we were hammering questions to get at the kind of the labor, but they were never answered. But then we found as we got to the end of our exhibit, there was a small free slave house that had beyond the fields, a new exhibit that talked about the life of the slaves on this particular plantation. And then from there, we drove through these Gullah neighborhoods, which I had worked previously in maybe a decade ago, and I had documented them because a lot of them are disappearing in North Charleston. And a lot of these are still on the grounds of former plantations. And so basically free slaves were giving deeded land around those pre-existing plantations where over the last few hundred years, Gullah communities have made their home and raised their families. And now with area rights and other infrastructure changes happening, they again are facing a peril as far as being on this land. And then we ended our two-day uh, charrette at Mother Emanuel. And this is the place of the massacre that happened. Uh, the young white North Carolinian who drove down and came to prayer service and basically massacred the pastor and those attending service. So this became kind of the, the atmosphere for getting people together to kind of think about how actually to tell a story, a story that has no resolution, that's open-ended. How do you begin to design a place on hallowed ground that might stir, that might stir the souls, that might get us to think of ourselves in a different way? And so for that, we developed 21 concepts. And these concepts came out of you know, ideas again picked up as we were moving through the diaspora in this landscape, but also through conversation. So there were ideas about holograms, broken chains, projections, recollections, poetry, Maya Angelou and I rise, clouds and figures, steles, remembering my ancestors. Could we talk about the Middle Passage? Could we think about the ground through the shells of the Atlantic? Could we think about the material that is actually used to build Charleston? Um, can we think about those relics that are in the landscape? Can we think about how people navigated the water? There was this amazing fisherman in the Mosquito Fleet at the turn of the century? Do we think about the piers that go down and hold that the mud is holding together? Or do we think about those things we want to offer our ancestors, those rituals that we want to conduct? Do we want to make new badges? You know, our thought was, could we make new badges and talk about how far we've come? Or should the entire harbor be an amphitheater for our ancestors? Or do we bring something out of the water like a serpent that begins to talk about the mythical relationships? Or is the ground something that needs to breathe and heave because those souls are lost underneath the earth and through the bricks that small African kids picked up mud and made with their hands, can we begin to make architecture and passages from that? So these concepts became a way to have larger conversations about how we want to design. And so then in conversation with the site, 
we began to develop these ideas. And through this, we had meetings of the committee where these ideas would be presented out and then there would be a discussion around them. And of course, city officials are in the room. We have everyone in the room. And so the conversations were relating to planning, relating to inspiration, aspiration, budget, all of these things were just part of this dialogue. And so this notion of the hologram, this idea of coming into a space and projecting uh, the architect, Harry Cobb, has designed a wonderful building that sits 13 feet in the air. So as long as a football field, the columns are two meters wide. And so this notion of these two meter columns that hold up this edifice, the idea was, could these columns become people? Could they become my ancestors as a way to think about holding up the world? And sort of through this kind of progression, the underbelly, of this building, can you begin to sort of make out these figures from the past and from the future? And then how people begin to participate with these columns that tend to oscillate and move. Or broken chains, the notion of liberation, the notion of freedom, the notion of being freed uh, was the idea of the chains. And could the chains be these things that again are held from the soffit that reveal the horizon, the horizon looking back towards Africa. Could they be about light? At night, the chains actually aren't heavy. They actually become more light and become a way of actually navigating and becoming more and more abstract. Or projections, could we begin to use the roof, the soffit, and the harbor as a way to bring the ocean and the harbor back into land. And through these progressions, can we bring people to the age and my ancestors rise up out of the harbor. And when they rise out of the harbor, they actually create this kind of spatial moment where again, you're looking back towards Africa. And then my Angelou's um, recanted frame over and over and still I rise. And in my head, I was thinking, could we hang or have bodies basically floating in the air and then could you just move through these entangled bodies that basically feel like they've just risen up from the ground. And it's a moment then, a moment of trying to understand, is that about the past? Is that about the present? Is it about the future? Or clouds and figures taking that idea that I just showed and bringing it under the soffit, so the columns and the soffit, so the entire underbelly is almost as if you exhumed the ground plane and lifted the ground plane, those who died here, and actually made them become visible as you're moving through. And in some places you might make them out, some places you might not, but they become this kind of conceptual effigy. And then a thousand steles, could we lay out stone and rock where we know there's spirits that live in these inert pieces of material? And could we then assemble them in a way in which they become more like a forest or a way in which you begin to weave a story? And then there, can we use a metric to talk about the lives lost, the languages lost, the changes to the diaspora? And then just basically in memory, this notion of remembering and when I was thinking about this, we were thinking of flooding the entire floor, right? So every hour you would come in and maybe we can't get under the soffit. And this notion of the flood of the deluge becomes large and gets reflected back in the ceiling. And this notion of countless bodies, right? This enumeration that one can't sort of discover the metric is something that we were thinking. And then the idea of using tabby. Tabby is a crushed shell material that you find in Georgia in the southern states. But can we take the tabby and actually begin to mound it? And then it becomes a reflection again from the ceiling and we get this kind of ground plane that becomes this huge sort of unnavigable space. But the shells themselves are collected from the Atlantic Ocean. And so this notion of the bodies that have been exhumed actually now become these forms, this new topography, this new topography again, that creates a kind of a boundless extent. 
and maybe through the enumeration, we might talk about place. We might talk about people. We might talk about the village. Instead of looking horizontal, maybe we turn vertical. And maybe now is the time to make something rise up. And can brick, you know, the use of brick is almost this kind of homogeneous element in Charleston itself. But can we bring the brick and allow that to actually speak and just speak in a different way? Maybe there's light, maybe there's shadow. And then on a more humorous, uh, which related to my ride back out to Sullivan's Island, maybe we just make a boat. If everybody gets on the boat, we have our own fleet, and that fleet takes us out. That's the memorial. And we go out on the boat all the way out, and then we come back. But maybe a memorial can begin to speak to those waters in a completely different way. or the pier that might extend out and extend out almost like the last walk that one has taken. And maybe that walk leads us back to Africa, or maybe it has ways to think about your arriving in Charleston. And then offerings. There's very few places, you know, I thought a lot about like the Vietnam Memorial and other places where leaving things have become problematic because I need a warehouse now to do it. But maybe if offerings were more ephemeral, and I started thinking about, you know, as a lot of my people are uh, dying on the streets of Oakland, we leave these little monuments of candles. And then the liquor stores are selling the candles. And before you know it, there's an economy of scale at around death. But it's through the offerings. And maybe the offerings is something right, that creates a new economy. Maybe it's sweet grass. Maybe it's really thinking about those kind of cultural things, patterns, and practices. And maybe they become ways in which people can leave something. And when we leave something, it creates this event. Maybe it creates this light and this power. And in the badges, of course, could we make new badges? And then could those badges begin to evoke different things, becoming columns, becoming new ways to tell stories? Or just a simple landscape move, like a dike, like moving the earth to grow ice, but can the landscape actually come in and actually create a different setting underneath this building that seems floating off of these two foot columns. And then lastly, a set of brick evocations that begin again to think about a topography, to begin to think about a metric of the rice plantations and the facades. And can that topography begin to rise up in certain places and become this new architecture? An architecture that is hidden, is concealed. And through these machinations, these became ways for us to know what was possible and what was not possible. And as you can imagine, <laughs> the critique of a lot of these things, fire at night, no way. Holograms on salt water, no way. So a lot of these things were, you can't do it because of this. You can't do it because of this. You can't do it because of this. But what was also wonderful was the, the conversation kept coming back to, but we have to do something powerful. And so a lot of the kind of restraints of doing certain things took us in a direction where we could come up with four different hybrids, which was again, a collection of ideas mixed from the 21. And so those hybrids really began to kind of talk about different things. Like the first one was about lifting. And again, this idea of the ground plane becoming a new topography, leaving under the building blank. And this new topography wouldn't force you to think differently, but maybe then that's the place for ritual to begin to happen. And then inside, you might find this ritual, this kinship inside. Or clouds and figures. You know, again, this interest in how to begin to think about the underbelly right, of this uh, football field, <laughs> you know, this long extent. And again, at the top and at the ground, the holograms, but literally to be enmeshed in figures 
uh, and then they go away and they come back. And then when you turn, maybe there's more figures. This is the warehouse looking towards the warehouse. And then at night, a different evocation. Or the badges, chains, and steles, all of these things tended to go together. And again, through this light, these columns and badges, there's this constant evocation of making. And then the steles, again, the wreaths and the chains. And then still I rise, again, bringing ritual right to the forefront, but also really being about the ground plane. And so we cut a hole for the warehouse, right? And we leave offerings through sculpture showing how the people who perished down below. And then as you rise back out, there are these spaces made in sweet grass within the grasses, places where you could actually have a ceremony, a ritual, and a place to look back towards Africa. And finally, from that through critique, we were able to settle on a single design which actually started taking a lot of these ideas to heart. And then this notion of a visitation, the ancestors having a place that talks about or that features the warehouse. And this was the place where slaves were stored until they were sold. Many perished here. There are stories of the food chain, sharks actually feeding really close to the coast. But here you see the basic elements, the six foot columns, the entry into the museum, the tide fountain with the figures. And this is stretching the figures back out and seeing them larger or even studying them and having them actually happen in different ways. And then looking back towards the harbor and should the chains be part right, of this evocation. And as the water runs out, again, the ground reads in a completely different way through that refraction of light off of the harbor. And then walking across the warehouse, the rice Negroes sit bowed down and you kind of levitate across this one solemn experience. And then underneath the cavity of the building, looking back across to the warehouse, seeing the quality of people in a hole. So as we then made our way from the concept, many of these things were built into the final design. The chains were thought of to not work with the figures. They felt heavy. We wanted the building to feel like it was still levitating and floating. So the idea of pushing the figures out back towards the water became a spot the warehouse, we wanted to keep the warehouse and have that experience be much more individualistic versus collective. And here you see the building looking from the harbor back towards the city of Charleston. You see it raised up off the ground and you see the public pier still able to operate. So the final piece is called Clouds and Figures. And here's the plan. The harbor's off to the right. And what we try to create here is a new colonial garden, one that's post-colonial, but one that takes in the same kind of patterns that one might read in plan, but the expression in third dimension is completely different. To the north, we have what we call the sweet grass landscape, the low country landscape that feeds into the southern landscape that becomes a ground of tabby. The tabby are shells that are monolithically laid out across the entire ground plane and actually reach up and grab the columns and become part of the columns as well. The warehouse is a piece here towards the bottom. We have a boardwalk that forces individuals to go through singularly next to reflective granite walls where you will see yourself and the rice Negroes and actually contemplate that position. So as you make your way from the city, the ground is agitated almost like the primary dune that one reads at any kind of ecological strand. You make your way through that primary dune and you find yourself again in the ground. Imagine you're in the ground of the ocean. The, the shells actually are laid out along the back. The city is taken away by the primary dune and you find yourself in this other place. We're coming from the harbor 
you can come through the sweet grass garden. And this is sweet grass grown all the way up to the edge that creates this field condition. And underneath this field condition is actually the infrastructure that keeps Charleston dry. So the pumping station is here. So we felt that that was a really interesting way of thinking about this particular landscape and up against them are cypress trees and oak trees that then a serpentine brick wall that creates this threshold back to this garden space. And then along this edge, we have our stele gardens where the rocks are allowed to speak and they speak in different African voices from the various tribes that came. An ethnobotanical garden that basically pedagogically teaches us the kinds of seeds and plants that maybe women put in their hair that people brought with them from Africa, those seeds of the diaspora. And then these planters, and these planters are places to propagate rice, to talk about that rice culture that created that billion dollar industry that created that first urban city in America where you had theaters, where you had culture blossoming over the backs of slaves that worked in the fields. And then looking back towards the wall, we just agreed on what the text will say. And it will say, and still I rise, I rise. And my Angelo's quote will be there that then will take you back around through the warehouse where you're walking in between the rice Negroes. And there's a quote by an observer of the day that talk about the deaths of people who perished within this warehouse. And at night, like most places in Charleston, you'll be able to move through the entire space, through these ancestral gardens, and actually find a place to sit and actually think about those who have come before you. And lastly, unlike the map that I showed you from Fort Moultrie, this is the Brooks map uh, that was published where a lot of abolitionists basically grew power out of this image of seeing you know, men and women laid in a hole, head to toe, head to toe, crowned here. And if you go to the National Museum down in the basement, you'll actually see the names of the ships that left port in Africa, and you can see those numbers. So let's say if the numbers were 2,000 left, you know, maybe 200 arrived. So you can really see how the Atlantic voyage actually cut short a lot of life and a lot of futures. But I came back to this image, which was that textile image, which was abstracted to a point where it allowed us not to have to mark gender, mark age, because it was abstract enough as long as the figures were full size. And then the fountain itself became this infinity fountain that created this metaphorical harbor condition because since we're seven feet down because of the seawall um, and the tide, that this now creates that water right at ground level. And then really pushing that our tabby has to come from the Atlantic. These were some of the first samples we did without the tabby. And then now we're looking at this reveal where maybe the tabby is everywhere under the building, but when you get to the fountain, it's only within the corpses. And so this reading, we're thinking about the amount that would read. And then in the seriality, as you would see it, water would fill those voids and actually create right, this other surface. And so along that edge, there is a steel, I think it's a one foot band, a stainless steel that runs the entire length of the site that marks the edge. And it's at a different geometry than the edge. And so it creates this kind of tension. And on there are located all the tribes. And we wanted to create that flash of the spirit because again, we're facing back east. So that morning light that rakes around and even the evening light that rakes around is gonna be really powerful against this edge. And then looking back out towards the harbor, you might arrive at the museum when the water is full. So it basically is an infinity fountain that tilts back. It'll fill up with water and then that water will drain out 
and it will leave puddles. And the idea was the puddles actually would create this interface, this kind of abstraction between the figure and surface. And as it moves daily and nightly, it will create this new place to go and think about our ancestors. Thank you. Oh. Wow. Wow. That's heavy. That's heavy. It's always That's heavy. heavy. Stuff. <laughs> so you can imagine what those two, three days were like. Oh, my God. Uh, well, I have to say, Walter, I'm not sure how the rest of the audience is feeling. Uh, people, please feel free to start sharing your questions. But I am in really in awe of the poetic delivery of this presentation. I timed, I was listening, listening to you and thinking, are you an artist sculptor or are you a landscape architect? You know, you're really like somebody who's like just on the edge of the, the break of the water and the, and the land going back and forth between the two, <laughs> like a crab. <laughs> How do you I am feel? a cancer, I'm a cancer. Well, there you are, there you go. <laughs> I'm a water, I'm a water animal. Um, I mean, well, how do you see I'm yourself? I see myself as, as an artist, just as a, you know, as someone who wants to make things. I don't, you mm -hmm. know, I don't like, I don't like being labeled. Um, and that's, you know, when I first got out of school and my undergraduates in landscape architecture, and there was something, you know, when I started out, I wanted to be an architect. I ended up in landscape architecture. So then as I practiced landscape, I then went back to architecture and I came back to landscape. And so I saw in myself that there was this restlessness, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and by the time I got to art school, it became very clear that the professional school education and then work in the profession is kind of limiting to how you, know, you can think because you're thinking within those silos Right. And uh, and there was an interesting thing that happened when I went to the Art Institute. I was in this like freshman seminar or whatever. And this kid was next to me, he must have been like 20, and we were going around the room introducing yourself. And, and you know, I can't remember his name, but he was like, I'm Michael and I sew. And I've been sewing all my life. And that just took took me somewhere. It was like, I can't imagine saying that first year <laughs> architecture, you know, it's like, I do this, you know, it's like, you know, we take you down and then we bring you back up. But there, there was this kind of richness of people just being, and it's really hard to kind of continue, right, working without, you know, finding those disciplinary boundaries, you know, or the silos. And so every project is an interesting ride trying to find a place where you can, you feel free. Right. free to give voice to something. And that's that's been the struggle in a lot of the yeah. work. It's a very expressive though, what you're doing. You're really expressing a lot. So I'll, let me get out of here. Questions are starting to roll in. Um, somebody, Janet Sharma asks, she says, this is so moving and beautiful and heartbreaking. When will we ever really comprehend the horrific, tragic shame of slavery? Probably never. At least I won't in my lifetime. I mean, it's going to take generations, but it's also going to take a willingness to want to talk about it. Yeah. Right. And I think that's been, you know, the thing for this project was there had to, I had to push a lot four years ago. Now, if we were doing this project today, it would be very different. Right. Because people, right are a little bit more open today. I mean, you know, we're dealing with a pandemic, a little civil unrest. We don't know what tomorrow is gonna bring. And we actually see that maybe we're more alike than we are different, you know, now that we've been locked down. And this is what, you know, one of my his history teachers always talked about, you know, this notion that, you know, in these places where you had slavery, you had blacks and whites together, there was a shared experience that we should be talking about versus the experience that was not shared because the richness is in that shared, which comes out of the arts, comes out of the food, comes out of a lot of different things, comes out of the dialect, comes out of all of these things that I think are more fruitful than the things that separate us. Right, 
Well, that's helpful <laughs> on a very on a very tough question. Um, so this is a practical question: Is this open to visitors yet? And <laughs> nope it it's, it opens in the fall of 2021. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those projects. It's probably the the scariest project I've ever worked on. Oh boy, yeah. So when right? it's a yeah. Right. What, what, when now it is officially open, what do you think the reaction is going to be? I have no idea. Right. I, you, have, I have no idea. Yeah. And and that's good. I mean, it's good. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, but I have no idea. But, you know, the meetings, I mean, even now in construction, you know, there we're, you know, we're still meeting about, you know, uh, what's the visitor experience, signage, you know, all of those things that are just right. really important to the overall feeling of a place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where did the funding come from? Multiple places. Joe Riley and others went on the road with the model. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Boeing, you know, a lot of places gave a lot of money, you know, gave money. Um, and, you know, this was years of fundraising. Uh, but once, you know, we had a building and a concept, I think it came, I wouldn't say it came easier, but they were, you know, they had more to go out and share, uh, you know, with donors and so we were able to meet the funding challenge the state basically did the matching funds and so we basically had to raise that match mm -hmm. but we were able to secure that prior to the mayor stepping down i think from being the mayor yeah mm -hmm. so um somebody's asking susan goodall how would or did the locale embrace this project ah that's a good question the project was not slated at the site uh, when it first was proposed it was proposed a block away mm -hmm. and when mayor riley um met with the late harry um from paycop free harry cobb um harry said you know the site needs to be over at the water and they walked over to the site which was a park. And the site was about, I think, gonna be sold for a restaurant or something. And the mayor said, you know, I think we own this. And they looked into it. And then I was brought onto the team. Then we went to the site and Robert um, had just wrote this piece on um, finding Gatston's Wharf. I don't know which came first, but it turned out either Harry had this amazing foresight that it should go here and then it turned out to be Gatson's Wharf, or you know, <laughs> there was some inkling of Gatson's Wharf, but it actually became, you know, this hollowed site. And then at this meeting, I said, Has there been an archaeological report? And they said, No. And the mayor was like, We gotta go out there and dig. Right. And you know, there was every reason not to dig. And I remember at a moment, you know, people from the city was like, you know, there's toxic stuff under there. And the mayor looked out the window and there was some guy digging a hole <laughs> with no hazmat stuff. He's like, if they can dig, we can dig. And so they dug the hole and it's actually on the news. It was on the news early spring where they found a lot of the remnants before they covered it back up. Uh -huh. So it's, uh -huh. it's an authentic site. It's an authentic wow. site. Wow, wow, amazing. So here's a, relating to the digging and the practicality of the construction were there challenges in soil and foundation composition as well as landscape yes. gradation yes. Uh, in order yes. to achieve yes. the effects you were able to you know the corpse symbol symbology yes. from the map so this is Meredith asking this question well um when Harry called me he said Walter this project is all about landscape and structure he goes I have Guy and I need you and he meant Guy Nordenson. So Guy is doing the structure, right? And so, yeah, it's huge because, again, we're in hurricane, right? We're in a coastal right. area. Um, and again, during any event, this entire landscape is probably going to get wet. Mm -hmm. Right? That's mm -hmm. just the reality. Right. So right. it's going to get wet. And so that's why the one way that we thought of just doing one monolithic material made a lot of sense. Yeah. And to not be too fussy with the landscape. And so right. there are these powerful sort of moments. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, so Faye uh, says that was a wonderfully emotional presentation. I love the Maya Angelou idea and still I rise. But is the, is the Toni Morrison quote anywhere in the museum? Will it be? 
is something that says we found the place. So you do plan to have I, I, eat I don't know yet. I, I'm now working on the narratives for each garden. And I might put Toni Morrison's quote at that first kind of dune garden where the benches are that we designed uh -huh. and back towards the piece. Oh, nice. Uh, but it's funny, it's funny she just mentions that because I'm writing this intro and I'm using Morrison's piece, which made me think that I should use it in the narrative as well. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. So how do you have a uh, pearl asks, how would you describe your emotional states at the beginning? <laughs> and when you're not quite at the end, but more towards the end of the process. It's not you're not at the end yet. Yeah. How's it, it evolved, I guess? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, again, it's the first project that I've, I think I've ever worked on where I was employed um, mm. to, to push right in a way yeah and I told, right and i told the, i told the committee i said we have to do something audaciously we have to we have to like not create you know these passive things we have to create something that you know puts the black body in space and everybody got behind it and so through those ideas there was a lot of things like uh, i remember one meeting you know these beautiful black women who had been coming to the meeting elder you know, they were like, I don't know how I feel about having those bodies on the ground. Right. You know, people are going to step on them. Right. And so that led to that kind of causeway. Right. That we put so that you can walk across. And then Harry was like, oh, that's like a metaphor to cross in the Atlantic. So, again, a lot of these comments help. How can I say? Um, simplify things to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting having that dialogue, like when I mentioned Flash of the Spirit, you know, no one said anything, but Dr. Bernie Powers was, ah, Robert Ferris Thompson, you know, and so there was just these really interesting uh, emotive conversations that were based on research, but also based on a kind of, you know, the mythical landscape that exists there. Right. And so. There yeah. was a kind of a freedom to talk about the rice negro. There was a kind of a freedom to talk about the food chain changing and the sharks were feeding. I mean, there was this, I don't know, it just felt it felt good to talk about these things that we normally don't talk about. Yeah, right? I can so see that. It was kind of a relief. So. Right, right. Yeah, and there was so much there. There was two, I mean, there was the, the whole, I had never heard of the rice negro. That was, a, yeah. That's yeah, and 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 this is something that you know we, covered a lot. We try to do in a lot of the projects, though, is you know the kind of the thickness of the research. You want to put it out there so that as you start removing things, what's left is still powerful. Mm -hmm. Versus you know the three schemes. I got that. I got the <laughs> the, the the out there scheme. I got the conservative scheme, and then I have the really conservative scheme. You know you're going to always end up in the conservative scheme. Or the one in the middle, right? And so again, we tried not to have that kind of, okay, we know we can get this done, right? It was like throw all of this stuff against the wall, right? right? And then allow certain things to kind of come out, and then have that discussion. And through that discussion of those twenty-one things, we were able to settle in on something. And I love that I, process that you described, and just like you said, yeah. throwing that all out there and letting things sort of. Yeah come out from it that 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 sort of allowed you to stay in that zone yeah but that freaks a lot of clients out you know because it's like <laughs> hold on where's my program you're not doing i know i keep thinking yet. what like, was, what's your client like how what was your client's response to all this were they were, did you feel like you were kind of in it together or was it a kind of thing where you were presenting well, that's why I showed the committee up front. You know, we built a really strong committee that we made sure we had the landscape architects from the city. We made sure we had all of these people. And of course, they were interjecting the more bureaucratic critique. But I have to say, you know, now the city landscape architects, they're like our main champions. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they're like, no, you can't do that. You know, in the beginning, it's like, <laughs> you know, you got to put in our kind of benches. You got to put in our standards and all this. And now it's like, oh, we, no, we got to go with something special here. We got to do something. Oh, that's so terrific. Through the process, so, I think a lot of people have been empowered to a certain degree. And there's so many people working on the project, too, that, you know, the voices 
they just come through. We have, you know, even in our meeting on wayfinding and things like that, there's multiple voices. So it's not just being done in a vacuum. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. I've never worked on a project like this. So somebody's asking if it, two, two kind of questions. One, um, is it, I love the presentation. Thank you. Did you have any input into the Legacy Museum or African American Museum in DC? We had um, a kind of a leadership relationship. Uh, I know Lonnie, mm -hmm. um, before he became the big hit, you know, he gave a lot of advice. Um, mm -hmm. This place is not going to duplicate DC. Half of this museum will actually be a place where you can come and actually trace your ancestors. So I'm waiting. I actually oh, that's great. don't don't know where my people are from and so i'm waiting for the museum to open so i can go here and actually you know find my ancestors and so a piece of the museum will do that and the other part facing the atlantic is really about the low country and the story here so uh -huh. it's not about the national story so hopefully there won't be any baseball in here there won't be any sports so <laughs> you know, this will be about charleston it'll be about people so two questions about Charleston, and one about you saying you don't know you you don't know much about your your ancestors. What this one is a simple one. Where did you grow up? North Carolina. So, <laughs> um, in the Northern Carolinas, and I always tell people, you know, we never went to South Carolina other than going to Atlanta. Uh -huh. And I have this thought in my mind that you know South Carolina was the genteel state. It's the state of like plantations and, you know, the white architecture. And so uh, my folk, we never like vacation in Charleston or Savannah. We went to Atlanta, right? right and so right. I never spent any time in Charleston until 2004. I was invited to the Spoleto Festival there. And so 16 years, the last 16 years I've been going there. But before that, I didn't know anything other than there were Geeches, that they ate rice. That's mm -hmm. all we knew because we ate grits in North Carolina. They eat rice. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So did you also? So the, the related question, I'm sure, at some point you visited the Charleston Slave Mart site as part of your research. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that and that site is somewhat of a fiction, you know, because again, through this kind of tourist economy in Charleston, you know, the Slave Mart actually. You know, Gaston's Wharf was a place where they sold slaves. The Mart was a place where I, I think you could entertain, but most of the the selling would happen in the alley. Yeah. Because it wasn't one of these kind of public spectacles, right? It just happened at the edge. And so when you yeah. go to the Slave Museum, it's a kind of a fiction that gets played out, right? You don't hear the story of the pest houses out at, you know, um, Sullivan's Island. You don't hear about the warehouse, uh, you know, where people perished and died. You can imagine it's Charleston in the summertime, right? The heat mm -hmm. and being packed into, you know, a, a, a brick building, you know, with others. Right. And so, you know, so I think you have to take a lot of those things with a grain of salt. And that's why we wanted to do this larger sort of expedition over two days to look at the low country and these communities that really give you a stronger sense of the impact of slavery, but also reconstruction and even contemporary, the contemporary landscape. Interesting. So from, do you now see an opportunity or an openness to weave narrative landscape architecture that represents the experience of, of native and African-American communities to areas or locations where those stories have been erased. Yes. And this is one of my one call to landscape architects. We have got to stop making parks in places where we've erased the lives of people. You know, I was just reading something today. There's a big park being planned somewhere in Texas. It was a fair. They tore down this neighborhood to build a parking lot. So the retribution is to make a park. We don't need any more parks. We need investment in people's lives, you know, and that yes. is multidimensional. We, there's no one answer to this legacy. And as landscape artists, we got to get out of these things, the community garden. We got to start thinking in different ways about ways to recover landscape. Because right. uh, just think about it. It's like generations of people's lives have just been taken away. And how would you feel to go back to a place you grew up and you ran and then there's a park? 
you know, there's no like indication, right? That there's a cultivated, right. you know, place here. And like, you know, Mandela here in West Oakland, you know, we had a freeway come down after the Loma Prieta earthquake, the double decker freeway came down, the freeway erased this amazing neighborhood. You know what they put in? They put in a parkway. It's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> So, so I just think we need more imagination. Um, and, yeah. you know, we just need more imagination. And yeah. there are lots of things. I'm teaching a studio right now on post-colonialism and trying to get my students to see and understand the medium differently. And we've been talking about the medium. The medium is light. It's air. It's water. <laughs> you know, that's the medium. And in a lot of places, people don't have good air. They don't have good water. They don't have good light. So you know, true. and so those are just simple things that we could do. That doesn't equal a park. It might equal something just much more fantastical, but it also might force us to dismantle this stuff that we built, right? The dismantling is, is probably yeah. the hardest part, but it's so important. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, if, but if we could all agree, it actually wouldn't be hard. You know, it would be our new black deal. Yeah, <laughs> a green deal, a new black deal, man. Go in there and dismantle. And think about all the jobs we would have just dismantling. <laughs> no, because you do, mean, then you have to like build something new, so you get two, two yeah. big areas of economic enterprise. Yeah. So, so, so if somebody says powerful project, wonderful visual representations. Uh, I think that what you said at the top about finding professional boundaries versus just being. Do you have advice for somebody studying landscape architecture later in life? Oh, Ooh, that's a tough one. Yeah, uh, the thing I would just do is just question all assumptions. Mm -hmm. You know, just question all assumptions. Um, I'm going to go back to my studio. One of my students found they're working on Mare Island, and back in like I'm going to say 1880, the admiral on the island told his, God, I don't even know what they would be called, the Navy guys who went out, the, the captains who went out to bring back plants from wherever you go. So of course, Canary Island, you know, Australia. <laughs> so all of these plants are here in the Bay Area, right? And if you look at the ecological history of the Bay Area, there are no trees. So again, we have, we have to talk about this fiction that we live in, right? I mean, so right. this notion that there is this kind of, this landscape is imminent. No, it's not. And I just think now is a time, now that we have this kind of crisis in environment, we have crisis in how we want to live together. I think now is a time for us to just say, yeah, we live in this fiction. So the possibilities are broad if it's a fiction, right? The possibilities just get opened up. It's like, okay, I can do that here versus that versus there's no one way and in a way we've been taught this kind of simple way that it's got to be this way right here's a book this tells you what grows here you can't put anything that doesn't grow here if it's not in the book and you know we're finding here in in oakland i can actually grow things that 20 years i couldn't grow here and they could only grow like in maybe san luis obispo mm -hmm. 100 150 miles away so I would say go for it. <laughs> Good advice. So back to the project, I thought we'd have time maybe for one or two more questions. Um, would you change anything about the project after what has transpired in the last eight months? That's a question from Bill. <laughs> I don't want to think about it, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I, I can't, you know, that gives me too much stress. Yeah. You know, I have another project that it took six years to build it's being built now right and it's just right. like right yeah i would change it but if i if i go down that rabbit hole i won't get any sleep yeah yeah so um but of, but of course but of course I of course we, I mean, you, the, in a way your work is never done because you're always thinking about ways you might have changed it if you could have so how did you how did you manage your emotions as you moved through the project oh i don't manage it must have been it, it just must have been <laughs> so emotional yeah but you know it's like i've had some experiences in my life you know uh that have been way more emotional i mean you know i've had guns drawn on me by police i've you know i've had all the the typical kind of things i've actually as a landscape 
our tech's been blackfaced in a community uh, in Georgia at the local club, and this is in the 90s. Um, and so I've had, you know, a lot of things professional. I've even had working on the De Young Museum, a guy comes up to me and said, do you know what we do to landscape architects? And he pointed like that, and then he walked out of the room. So it's like, you know, if you're dealing in the public realm, there's just stuff to deal with. And if you look like me, there's these other these other things that you have to deal with, you know, that, you know, you're normally the only one who looks like you when you walk into the room, um, you know, that, you know, I've worked in places like Wyoming, you know, you know, in Buffalo, you know, places where the context, I've had to learn it, right? Uh, thank God for John McPhee and you know, <laughs> great Western movies, Shane, yeah. Shane, come back, you know, so I could draw yeah. on all of those <laughs> cultural things to be in a place. Uh, but no, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting yeah. Yeah. You know, time and it's an interesting place to work. You know, um, Walter, thank you so much. We have, I'm sure, other questions. I won't, cannot get to them all. I've worked <laughs> over time now. There are many people who are writing in just to say how much they, you know, how what a wonderful emotional presentation. Bravo, very moving and poignant. So you've uh, struck a chord with a lot of people in this talk. Thank you for that. Many people saying that they can't wait to see the site in person. Tell us again. I can't when, either. When do you think it's going to well, open? Fall, fall of 2021. Okay. Uh, um, so around this time think, next year. This time next year. And it's probably going to be Harry Cobb's last building, actually, because Harry just passed away uh, this past spring, um, you know, right before the, the, the shutdown. I was in New York to interview him for the book, uh, and mm. I found out he had passed away. And so, you know, this is, um, it's been a long journey for a lot of people, you know, Mayor Riley, you know, a lot of the African-American community in Charleston, uh, Moody Nolan, the, uh, the architectural firm, that's the record architect, they're African-American firm mm -hmm. uh, in Columbus, two generations. And so I just think this is gonna be a really good threshold to cross over and hopefully there are more projects like this. You know, you know we've seen, you know, the exhuming of enslaved laborers at UVA. We've seen you know, the civil rights, you know, peace go up. We've seen a lot of other stories being put out in the landscape. And so I'm hoping that there are going to be a lot of places where I can go and think about my ancestors. Oh, I hope so too. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And then we can imbue. This, this is so wonderful. Yeah, we can imbue them with the spirit. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Um, no problem. Somebody says my cup run. Thank you, New York. Come visit us in New York, please, when we're open at the garden. We would love to have had this at the New York Botanical Garden. So when we do open, we hope that you invite come. me to do something I mean, at we, the Botanical we, Garden. We, I could come and make something there, you know. We are open. The garden is open. It's just that our lecture hall is here. Yeah. But we maybe we could. We could see about that. I want to tell all on behalf of all of our audience, thank you so much. And I just want to remind the audience that we do have the winter lecture series coming up in January. Three great, great speakers, Sue Stewart-Smith, Leslie Bennett, also from Oakland, California, and Larry Wiener. Um, and in the next month, we have two symposiums, one on First Nations, where we're gathering Indigenous experts, um, Native Americans, for a wonderful symposium, as well as a, a symposium coming up in November on plant extinction. So check our website, check it, sign up, um, and thank you again for coming, and thank you so much, Walter. Thank you, guys. And Susan, I know you're <laughs> out there somewhere. <laughs> yes. Thank you very okay. much. Good night, everybody. Okay, Barbara. Take Thanks care. Again.